Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, Hum by Verizon, RockAuto.com, State Farm, and AutoTempest.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome, everyone, to MotorWeek podcast number 179. We're all huddled around our odd-shaped table here in Studio C at MotorWeek World Headquarters. With me today is Dave Scribner, our head writer and executive producer. Hello. He's making his a rare appearance. Writer, producer, Brian Robinson. Hello, John Davis. Thank you, sir. Online content coordinator, Greg Carlos. That is me. And our video producer, editor, Joe Ligo, has stepped out from behind his monitors and camera. Joe, welcome. Glad to be here. Okay. And a little bit later, we'll be introducing you to our new FYI reporter, Stephanie Hart. But first, um, most recent auto show, wrapping up the uh, 2018 auto show season, New York International Auto Show Everyone at the table either went or is, knows quite a bit about it. There were a lot of new vehicles there. Rather than run down a list, um, why don't you pick some from the list and talk about them. Brian Robinson, yeah. what impressed you from what you saw? That, that uh, information? From the pictures, uh, two that stood out to me was the RAV4. Not that I'm a huge RAV4 fan, but... It's uh, the biggest seller other, in its class. Yeah, yeah, and it looks is. way different, way more rugged. I really like to look at that. And uh, the Volkswagen uh, Atlas pickup. The Tan Oak. Um, yeah, so you, they've they already sell like a four door pickup in Europe. Yeah, uh, which I think does really well over there. So I was kind of hoping they that would eventually make its way over here, and uh, looks like it will. Can't wait to drive it. You know, they were so negative about its production prospects that really? that was really surprising. They basically said they all but said we're not going to build it now, <laughs> and you, and then I I. Caught one of the executives, and I said, "What's going on? Why? Are, you know, it's built off the same chassis that you're building the Atlas. You're already going to do the uh, the short ass this what Atlas Sport uh, Cross Sport." And I said, "What's the deal?" And he said, "This vehicle, as you see it here, is too expensive. Mm-hmm. The, so whatever they build, and I'm like you, convinced they're going to build something." It'll probably be a little bit less. Now, I didn't share any body panels except maybe the doors with the Atlas, but it is built on the same chassis. And if Honda can make money on the Ridgeline, basing it on their SUVs, I don't see why they can't in their yeah. Chattanooga plant. I think everybody was very impressed with it. Uh, something else, anything else, the new Subaru Forester, which uh, coming into the market where it, you know, it's such a, a hot property, I thought that was a standout. The the, car, the show had a lot of standouts. Yeah. Nissan Altima, yeah, sorry. You, you actually, um, I was following everything back here, and uh, you had actually tweeted one of the first pictures of yeah. the door handles on two different planes because it if you look at it's it like from a wedge shape kind of well yeah. if you look yeah. at it from a profile it looks odd because the 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 body line the contour right. doesn't really come out to you but if you look at it a three quarter then you see where the door handles actually do follow the body line and i thought it was pretty unique and as i walked around the show i saw a couple of other sedans that also had it but they seemed to be a little less um Extreme, I guess. But yeah, if you look at the side of the Altima, which I thought was a is a beautiful car, uh, and another attempt by moving the mid uh, the mid market uh, mid size sedan up level, um, it was quite stunning looking. Uh, absolutely. So I, you know, they are they like uh, Toyota and Honda are not abandoning the uh, mid size sedan market. And Lincoln the, Aviator. Now this one was weird to me because they kind of slid. <laughs> Joe in. jumped in on a Lincoln. Yeah, they kind of they kind of slid Finally. in. That it's rear-wheel drive, because I was thinking it's Rear-wheel drive based. Right. I was thinking it's going to be based off the Explorer. That it is. Same eight, it's but based the, on the new Explorer. So the new Explorer is going to be rear-wheel rear drive rear as well. Drive so they're finally right. getting rid of that, like, ancient Volvo-based platform that they've had since, like, 2000. Well, they still whenever. make other stuff on it. But, yeah, they're basically saying there is a somewhat trend back towards away from a front-wheel drive architecture to a rear drive architecture for... Uh, SUVs. Uh, Chevy supposedly is going to do the same thing. You've already got a bunch of them at Toyota, of course. Uh, right. but yeah, the new so Explorer, be... and this is uh, rear-wheel drive base, so rear and four-wheel drive. So that that was the strangest thing, because it seemed like Ford had pretty much given up on rear-wheel drive, except for trucks and the Mustang. But to hear them say, we're going to make a rear-wheel drive, I'm assuming yeah. it's a crossover. It's not body-on-frame or anything like that. Correct. 
So that yeah. stuck out to me as weird. And the plug-in hybrid thing is is will be interesting to see in practice how that plays out with well, that so platform. My guess is that you know they're going to sell enough explorers that it'll probably pay off to well, have. So that. far, nobody's actually seen their PHEVs flying off the lot that I'm aware of. Mm. Uh, Cadillac XT4, their compact uh, luxury SUV, has sort of got buried. It's like yeah, it was there. Uh, it didn't. It looks actually pretty interesting, but even at the unveiling, there was such a party going on around it, almost nobody <laughs> saw it. And it, it seems like it people is, were having too good of a time. I was working yeah. uh, the you, CT6 yeah. uh, V Sport, which has the, the I thought their that new was engine. A, a, met, a much more interesting vehicle. Go ahead, t- take um, it away, Dave. Twin turbo V8. It's in the 500 horsepower club. Um, they package the turbos in the V of the engine up top and a lot of stuff on the bottom of it to make it easier to package it. And um, I want to see more about the engine. Also in the engine department, there was the uh, the Jag F-Type SVR. Mm-hmm. Their also first the SVR for their, an SUV. And uh, Maserati Levante showed an engine package with their hot rod version, also in the 500 horsepower club. So all, I can't afford them. I'd like to have either one of them, but <laughs> I wish I could afford one. Going back to the Caddy V8, uh, they, of course, are claiming that nothing, no one else is going to get that engine, which is not the first time they've made such a claim. But there, I think everybody was thinking, is this going to be the V8 that's going to be in the new mid-engine Corvette? And they swear no. Hmm. But they needed that engine, they felt, and I think I agree, to be more on the level of the BMW and Mercedes, which is what to they show their aspiring technology to be. Acumen. And if they ever do come out with a Good flagship word. car. The uh, Genesis G70. The uh, you know, Another fine-looking sedan. Um, that's their entry <laughs> level, right? Yeah. yeah. The three series. I thought the G80 roughly. was their entry level, or is this the low Well, that? this is now... I believe this is now the lower number. number. Well, it's the key. Well, I assumed the number was the the clue, but I didn't. It's based on the Kia chassis. Yeah, you can get a. Oh, okay. You can get a manual transmission in it if you want, which I thought was pretty cool. As long as you stick with a two liter uh, mm. turbo, you can't get it in the. I think they have a twin turbo V six. Can't get a manual with that one, but you get a eight speed auto. Uh, I misspoke before and said uh, huh? uh, Kia and put it with Altima, but I really meant to put it with the K nine hundred. Um, you know, a nice looking car. I'm not sure again that too many people are going to buy it. We like the last K900, and I thought this one looked a lot more up level. But um, what else did we see? Oh, the um, Genesis Essentia concept kind of stole the show oh, with wow. the wow factor. It it's sure just, did. It's so stunning looking. And that was an EV. Was it a PHEV? I'm, uh, I'm not sure. It was, yeah. it was all electric. All electric. All electric but you had the scissors doors, and uh, it, was it was stunning. But mm-hmm. again, I mean, Not if that's practical, what they're probably, aspiring to. Yeah, I think, and if it was a different show, um, if it was actually at, like, Detroit of this year, that probably would have gotten more attention. But I think you alluded to it earlier, John. There were so many really major reveals. You got a RAV4, which is a huge seller. You right. got the Ultima, Ultima, big seller. <clears throat> Even the Corolla hatchback, which is me being a millennial, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, yeah, so there was just a lot of... It seemed of... like there was more news out of New York than Detroit this oh, year. Yeah, without sure. question. Like, without what's, question. what's going on? I thought Detroit more... was supposed to be the biggest show of the year, but uh, it's... Not anymore. Um, I, I think a lot of... Well, for whatever reasons that p- people have been pulling out of the Detroit show and not showing their best hardware, last year in New York wasn't that impressive. This year, it was easily the best auto show uh, in the U.S. this year as far as new product. Uh, what else didn't we haven't we covered? The Acura Acura showed the production version of the RDX with the first A spec package. Uh, back to VW, they showed showed their um, shortened Atlas, which is called the Cross Sport. That's um, a five passenger on the same chassis. Five and passenger, same. and apparently um, same wheelbase as I believe, but I just shorter by right. seven inches. Wait, or so. Didn't yeah. it have like kind of a sharp cut off on the mm, rear roof mm, line or something? A little bit. Uh, Hyundai Santa Fe uh, is new. Yeah. And, so it was uh, the CX-3 oh, had a basic uh, yeah. little bit of a nose job done to it. That's about mm. it. And the Corolla hatchback replacing the Toyota IM, the leftover Scion. Mm. So what's, how long has it been since Corolla had a hatchback? Was it a three-door? It goes way, way no, back? No, it was the Matrix, right? Oh. Wasn't that considered a yeah. the Pontiac vibe Toyota Corolla Matrix? That yeah. was, that, but I don't, they yeah. built those up until Numi closed, yeah. which was like 2000. Nine. But you're the auto historian. Didn't oh Corolla have a fastback three door? I lost my job. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna look at Ben. Way back, back. way back. back. Yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's the longest like running. 80s. It's one of the longest running, if not the longest running, name plate out there. Yeah. So. yeah. 
I think we've done a retro review on that one, so check YouTube. Okay. Moving on to something uh, even more exciting, if that's possible, and I think it is. Dave Scrivener has had the rare privilege mm. of driving the 2018 Ford GT. And, David, I think that's about all I'm going to say about it. Why don't you take it from there? <laughs> well, the toughest part is finding a place to drive it, John. We picked it up in Compton and had it for 11 hours. I said, where do you go in L.A. with a Ford GT? <laughs> where so, do you get out of traffic We headed for the hills. Maybe you shouldn't tell us. Yeah. <laughs> An unnamed road in the, uh, the mountains near Los Angeles. Um, really, it's a, it's, a, it's a race car up on the street. And, uh, it kind of shows that when you drive it on the street, it's a little lumpy, bumpy, crude. Um, disappointment in the, the engine note. And it's a V6 with great horsepower, 647. You kind of miss that V8 rumble, though. Uh, the only thing that soured it for me was that. Driving dynamics, it was fabulous. It just a little bit of lag and then just gone. So unlike the 2005 GT, which was clearly a production car, this is more like the GT40 from the 60s. This well, is they a didn't race have time car to develop two cars, you know, a race car and a street car. They kind of made one car until Molly got it for Le Mans, which they won two years mm-hmm. ago. And um, it, the, the street car suffered a bit for it in creature comforts. Those who want to have it are certainly thrilled to have the performance on the street. I wouldn't drive it day to day. I don't certainly worth four hundred and fifty thousand to oh, park in your to garage. Me, nothing is to me. But I, I just drove <laughs> a, an 05 GT a few days ago, and uh, yeah. love that car still. Me too. <laughs> that was sweet. Yeah, I really think that was the car. I wish I could. Prices have are ticking up on those things in a hurry. They are. Yeah. What do they go for now? I don't know. You would think the new GT would maybe make prices, you know, would make the la- last one less collectible, but it seems well, the it's opposite. It's more affordable. I like, like yeah. have that, but and it's a, it's probably more coattails. comfortable. It's definitely a more comfortable car. I guess. Definitely. Um, zero to sixty three seconds. Did it feel like it? You had a lot six hundred, oh, yeah. almost six hundred and fifty horsepower. Most definitely. <laughs> would you? <sighs> So you've driven, you drove the 05 and you drove this. How would you I've compare? the original, that? too. How would you compare it to all three? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah, we did. Uh, that was, was that the car we had up at um, we did in one Pocono? In Pittsburgh. We did one Where, in Pittsburgh, the yeah. orange car. Um, anyway, um, I, I like the 05 still. Okay. <laughs> I think that sums it I up. I think the GT4 is my, my, my ultimate dream car. But, uh, but, but on, a, on a track, the, the new one would. Spank well, with, the old oh, dust. Oh, it just wouldn't, even, it wouldn't even be a this car. Is a, this is, is a true close. supercar. It yeah. Be yeah. Hyper car. Yeah. Track worthy just the way it sits. Hypercar. Got to be hypercar. careful yeah. about that, yeah. apparently. And Why? I, because I've gotten crap from people. Why about <laughs> supercar? I've got a supercar and a hypercar. I think the. I thought hyper was supposed to be over a million apiece. The the road test is going to air next week, and it'll be on YouTube soon after that. But I. I liked the flying buttress styling on the rear. When I first saw the photos, I wasn't. It wasn't. It looked doing like it a, Fer- a La Ferrari swallowed a GT40 and spit it out the front a little bit. And just the, the back is so weird looking. I still so think unford like. It is. The front uh, it still is looks like a GT40, like, like the 05. The aesthetics did. is not the high point of that car. Mm, it's just all performance uh, it's, and it's, the wow factor of yeah. driving. It. Forget who I had the conversation with, but it's to me, it's a completely different buyer. I mean, you go. Sure. The, uh, somebody who bought an 05, I don't see them wanting to go out and get the, they the got new some blue collar buyers. It was 139 new, which is yeah. outrageous. Mm. You know, and now they're three, still, right? Um, now they're selling for around yeah. three. Yeah. Let's go back to the terminology again. So what else in the market do you consider a hypercar, or does the our audience consider a hypercar? I mean, that's it's a relatively new LaFerrari, car. LaFerrari, LaFerrari, 918 those, Spider. Yeah, yeah. I think it has P1. to be like a hybrid to be a hypercar, or Ooh, like plus. Really? Like, well, like the LaFerrari and the P1 and the the. Well, I don't think you have. I don't think you could say that. I think you'd have to put a horsepower. Some scenarios are yeah, hypercar. Six, well, okay. seven hundred horsepower. Yeah, I, well, we, we actually had this debate in many podcasts ago. And yeah, go back and watch that I mean, one. Honestly, a supercar now you could you could call anything that does just below four seconds to sixty. I think a supercar. Yeah, and there's yeah. a lot of cars that do that. that. And then what yeah. about a ZL1 yeah. will do that. Yeah, and then so, so sub three yeah. is a hypercar and sub or sub four. Well, I'm just yeah. I'm just putting out possibilities. I'm not yeah. saying yeah. there's I'm a I'm not sure. I don't think there's a cut and, and dry definition. I think I'm arguing that I shouldn't be chastised for 
<laughs> interchanging. <laughs> I just, yeah, there's, yeah. there's overlap. I, yeah. Leave me alone, people. As long right. as there's the internet, there will be chastisement. And, and, you know, that sounds like a good point in this uh, discussion to actually go into our rants and raves before Did Dave leaves us. And, Dave, you actually had something you wanted to talk about. I have about. a rave. He has a rave. I'm usually the ranter. <laughs> um, the new car colors that are out there, I'm, I was love to see that RS5 at New York had a, a lovely, not quite a forest green, mm-hmm. but an interesting green shade. I'm just so tired of seeing black and silver cars all the time. And you said something else before our, we... Our new Crosstrek as a long-term has a, have a lavender gray mm-hmm. shade to it. Uh, just... Even the um, uh, CX-3 we had in, which looks white when you first look at it, but it's not. It's got yeah. like a little bit of a gray Very tint pearly. to it. It actually white. looks really yeah. nice. Yeah. So interesting car colors on the comeback. Yeah. Great story for yeah. Stephanie. Well, it's, New Mustang it's, has it's cool a colors. good thing. Uh, you know, a lot of the car colors have gotten so boring. It they really make and boring sales. Boring sales, and you know, then you slip into a wind tunnel, and they all come out looking the same, and it sort of. Oh, they predict the car colors. Five, what's going to be hot five years from now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a very. There's a lot of time and effort that goes on into that, do perhaps, that. Right? Yeah. I. I talked to a woman once who worked in color in a, at like car design like that was her job was color that mm-hmm. was it and she said they would have these big meetings every year there was like a national association of color designers not necessarily for automobiles just for color and they would meet and talk about what colors are in and what well, colors Pantone. are out yeah Pantone. The, the, the big company yeah that controls and they'd all talk the colors. about what was in and what was out and oh well we think she said green was always one of those colors that every five years you'd get a couple green cars and then they go away again they yeah, said she sure. said green was always cyclical and personally i like green sure. i think pine green and those kind of dark greens can as look really cool it's not around the gills <laughs> David, thank you very much. Of course. And we're now going to bring to the microphone and the seat that he has nicely Here's warmed. Thing, our new oh, FYI reporter, like Stephanie like Hart, who has just joined the Motor Week staff, and we're delighted to have Stephanie with us. And she's already been out there working on two stories. Welcome, first of all. Hi, thanks your, for having me. Your, yeah. Thanks for being here. Tell us about your first two FYI stories that you've got coming up soon. Um, Well, the first one was a really tough assignment you guys gave me. I got to go to Los Angeles, California, and I checked out the Peterson Museum, and it was just so eye-catching from the outside. It was red and white, zebra-striped on the outside. It just went through a major $90 million renovation. Uh, And we haven't been there since it opened over 20 years ago. That's right. It started with about 100 cars, and now it's grown to uh, three floors filled with cars, more than 100 cars, really luxurious inside. They had three major uh, displays. That you, is that, Am I correct in the number yes. that you basically covered? Mm-hmm. Um, we started with the Porsche effect, mm. which was just really amazing. A lot of very rare Porsches. Mm-hmm. We which saw, have a very close tie with Hollywood. Exactly. We <laughs> saw a 1939 Type 64, mm. really sleek lines. Um, we toured that vehicle. We also saw a couple of 911s, um, spoke to a couple of Porsche enthusiasts who just were going crazy mm. for the exhibit. We also saw the competitive side of Porsche there. Um, we saw a 550 Spider. Mm-hmm. Very famous car. Then we went up to the second floor and we saw um, cars from the movies. Which sort of dovetails into the Porsche display pretty well. Yeah, so we really saw the Hollywood effect kick in up there. Um, We saw the DeLorean from Back to the Future. (laughs) With all the the stuff still lighting up and blinking. All all the the wires coming out. The flux capacitor. It was blinking. The kids, you know, went crazy for it. Um, So that was really exciting. Uh, We also saw the Batmobile Mm -hmm. in all its glory. Uh, We also saw the convertible from Thelma and Louise. That was neat because you actually got to sit in it, and you said that it's a little beat up on the inside, like the trim and the leather and stuff, a lot of wear and tear on it. Yeah, Hollywood just uses the car for that one great shot. And then they sort of uh, beat up the interior because it's not going to be seen in the picture. So. Yeah, I, I mean, often <laughs> they get these things out of junkyards and completely rebuild them. So, mm-hmm. of course, I'm, I doubt that car was. But uh, 
you while you were out there, though, you did uh, another story that I guess best could be described as an easy way to. I mean, California is famous for its customization, but this is kind of like customization inside, and in the end, a, a relatively easy way to redo at least how you feel about the car. You want to tell us more about that one? Yeah, so we after uh, the Peterson Museum, uh, the next day we went to the uh, Catskin Automotive uh, Factory where they do custom leather interiors. So we got to see how um, the interiors come out, and that was a really, really cool process. Now, this is, a, this is a custom leather interior that just about anybody can mail order and have applied to their car. You don't have to take it to them, do you? No, so prices start at fifteen hundred, which, which is crazy yeah. cheap for custom leather interior. Super I would affordable. Think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they go up to about twenty two hundred. So most of it is a leather panel, and the sides are vinyl mm-hmm. to keep the cost down. Mm-hmm. But I mean, they can do everything: embroidery, perforation, put different colors different together, different colors, two tone. Yeah. So you know, there were hundreds of workers inside this factory in Montebello, just sort of hand sewing everything you know you haven't seen that in i don't know when no because usually if you go to say um any of the european uh customizers uh like amg and so forth they're they're basically doing custom leather interiors for you know whatever they're working on and you're talking giant bucks so this kind of fits between that and your run-of-the-mill off-the-shelf leather shell that you can get for a car so were you impressed with what you saw oh yeah it was amazing yeah it was it was really awesome so you got it done to your car right i I wish (laughs) but we did see it get it get done to a subaru here in maryland Mm -hmm. which was really amazing uh really impressive um we also went to um a garage in Laurel, Maryland, and saw how they actually install the seat covers. So, so like um, a before and after kind of thing where you can watch mm-hmm. them, the process of getting it. Yeah. Do, do they have a list of, uh, I guess, a list of installers that they use so they send the packages to someone in your area? Or yeah. How does that work? Um, they have several warehouses and installers oh, okay. across the country. So the Montebello a factory we visited specializes in customs. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we followed a package here to Maryland. They opened the package and they, uh, installed the seat covers. So, you know, they had to take out all the wires, unclip everything, Mm -hmm. basically strip the seat down to nothing, to the metal. Um, and then they put the seat covers on from there. Sounds like they a, use a steam. fun segment, a little bit, a little bit different than than what we usually see when you see the uh, the corner uh, auto upholstery shop these days. Well, you got both of them coming up. Welcome to the show. Thank I want you. you to stick around for the end of the podcast. Here, we're going to uh, go now to a viewer question, and this is from Bob from Roseburg, Roseburg Oregon. Mm. Um, Thank you for pointing out the importance of keeping your windshield clean in cars with sensors and cameras. You're welcome. Can you recommend a good way to clean the inside of a windshield? This always frustrates me. Anyone have any uh, particular chemical that they use for to get that? There is a film that often builds up on the inside of a windshield. It comes from, like, interior materials releasing gases. And uh, I'm not sure if he's looking for a product or a technique or what, but uh, I don't think. What do you do? I just have, like, a glass cleaner automotive style glass cleaner like a mcguire's yeah, or something use, like that uh, you know double up on the uh cloths and uh just uh, give it the best you can it is tricky with you know getting all the corners and stuff like that but uh, i don't really have any they special do have a tool technique. that can help you like yeah. do the corner but i don't know if it's worth the, the extra trouble my D- thing does is does newspaper I've, really work i don't use newspaper i've crumbled up newspaper i've heard that i've used it before on the outside i never tried on the inside just because it gets wet and starts falling apart my big technique is make sure you pull into the shade because if the stuff dries too fast then it streaks it streaks and then the other good good, the other thing i do is i make sure to wrap my hand in whatever like if i'm using a cloth or whatever because what invariably happens to me is you're like upside down and then this greasy part of the side of your hand smears the windshield and then you just get a big greasy streak and have to start not everybody has a greasy side of their hand well, wow. that's okay. So my point is, is okay. don't let your skin you touch. Using? Don't let your skin touch the glass. What that's are you my using? Point. Are you using a microfiber I've, cloth, a, a terry cloth? I've what? gone back and forth. I guess microfiber tends to 
be what I default to as long as like a clean one that has been used on another part of the car. But the other thing is for cleaner, I've used Armor All Specialty Automotive Glass Cleaner, and then I've used like Windex. I found that Windex does work better than like knockoff Windex that you yeah. know you get at Walmart or whatever. But the Armor All stuff, I didn't see a big big difference. Versus I, I like the requires. But you know what? I also like, and I don't know how hard they are to get anymore. But you used to be able to get from uh, cleaning operations used baby diapers and they're very soft and they had a good cleaning i still have some at home washed of course of course yeah they've all they've come back they basically are are torn or whatever they can't be used again and they sell them in big bundles um, as cleaning cloths if you can still find those they make a good clean but yeah they there's whatever they've been washed so many times that they're so soft they do a pretty good job Okay, very good, everybody. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, partic- participating in our Motor Week Podcast 179. Stephanie, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Dave Scrivener, who's left, Brian Robinson, Greg Carlos, and Joe Ligo. Our uh, th- thanks today also to Jim uh, Bigwood, who is making us on the audio sound- side sound better than we should, and our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. Uh, Until next time, I'm John Davis. Be sure to check our website at motorweek.org for listings. We have a new listing feature to give you a much better situation of knowing exactly which public television station to watch us on. And you can also see us every week on the Velocity Cable System. Until next time, I'm John Davis, Davis, and I can't even say my name this afternoon. Thanks for watching, listening, and being a part of Motor Week. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week. Television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, Hum by Verizon, RockAuto.com, State Farm, and AutoTempest.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.